I first started for Black Cat back in 2004 on this boat here, the Canterbury Cat. After working my way from deckhand to skipper and manager, some 15 odd years later, I'm now running the business as chief executive. The Black Cat Cruiser's story is one of determination, overcoming challenges and commitment to our community and the environment. It's a story that started over a hundred years ago here on the Banks Peninsula from our founding family and continues to be written by our team who have delivered for decades. This is our story. Enjoy. My family moved to the peninsula in the late 1920s to become managers of Godley House in Diamond Harbour and they ran that for a number of years and then they took over the post office run from Littleton on the ferry and used to go down and pick up the mail every day. My grandfather used to meet the ferries when they came across with the mail and parcels, meat from Littleton, groceries. There was no bus around the harbour in those days, it, that came later. And he used to meet the ferry with a, a big sled with the horse. By the time my father got to be in Diamond Harbour and running a taxi, he used to meet every boat that came across. And he also picked up the mail and took it up, not on a horse and sled, that was a car by that stage. One of my earliest memories is going and meeting the Diamond Harbour Ferry. Would have been probably sometime in the early 70s with, with my grandfather to pick up the mail. And it was pretty clear they had a pretty deep connection with the community through operating that service. I married a farmer. We went for a lands and survey block job down on the Tianau Basin. And we were there for nearly 10 years in fact. And during that time, because we wanted to save for our own farm, we made the decision that crayfishing was in a bit of a boom at that stage, so we thought we perhaps could do it as well. So that's how we got from farming to fishing, and everybody, all the family included, thought he was quite, quite mad. We moved to Akarara in 1979, and the family started operating various different businesses uh, on the main street, on Beach Road. We said to the agent, what else is on your books? And he said, oh, we've got a gift and wine shop. Went, oh, okay, let's go down and have a look at that. So there it was right on the waterfront. And across the road was a little boat hire. Finally, we bought the paddle boats and canoes off him. A few years later, we bought a charter yacht. And then we thought it would move on to the next stage, which could be perhaps as we'd had a good example in Tiana of a the tourism company that perhaps it was time to put a boat that we could take tourists out. There'd been a couple of cruise operations here in Akaroa over the years but no one had been able to make it work. And the family fell about laughing because um, Ron was a very quiet person, very private and the thought that he might stand up in front of people and talk about things was really just too much. Dad had come from a background of fishing by himself in Fiordland and you know, a high country farmer with uh, sheep dogs and horses. So a lot of his life was spent by himself and then he kind of had to reinvent himself to get in front of a microphone and uh, uh, become an entertainer. Because that's kind of the way I looked at it, that this was one of the first ecotourism operations in the whole country. And ecotourism, it's a lot about education and obviously in the environment. But the most important thing is to um, entertain people because that's how people uh, come back. So he became a, a very good storyteller. And uh, right from the first day in 1985 to the day he finished in 2006, he always had this great enthusiasm for storytelling and was extremely proud of you know, the harbour and everything that it provided. And welcome on board the Canterbury Cat for our cruise this morning. Um, my name is Ron, I'm the captain, and Helen is my assistant today. We'll be sharing a couple of hours out in the water. The beautiful Akaroa Harbour. On our very first day of operation, we had um, six passengers that we were, could hardly wait to get them off the wharf and onto the boat. Thought it was great. People actually wanted to get on the boat. And it cost them $8. You know, every day was like a first day. And so for us customers, it was their first day. And it was a hell of a skill to have, um, to be able to provide that first time experience uh, to everyone with such enthusiasm. In 1985, Akaroa was much quieter. It went through peaks and, and shallows, and it was going through a bit of a shallow at that time. Not many people 
in Akaroa, not a lot of permanent people, very few international tourists. The first international started to be brought over by um, Pacific Tourways and we'd seen this bus come in every day, sometimes two or three people, sometimes ten and more, and we thought, hmm, might be part of a market that we could tap into. Look, it was a reasonably logical step to start operating a small cruise boat. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time out on the harbour, a lot of people um, on these little canoes and dinghies and paddle boats and a uh, beautiful harbour to see, but no one was doing it. And I think the real difference um, with the approach the company had was a real commitment to do it every single day. Because when we first started doing it, it wasn't like every day in the school holidays or every day in the summer. It was every single day forever after, effectively. And it was a real commitment to um, operating the service and doing it properly. The Charmaine was a, was a beautiful boat and a great way to get into the market. But I do recall when my parents decided to buy this large catamaran that everyone thought just one thing, that they were mad. You have to have money to do these things. So we had to go to the bank man cap in hand and ask for a whole load of money. And that was always a bit scary because um, they let us have the money and three weeks after we got the Canterbury Cat on the water, the 1987 market crash happened. So everybody waited for us to fall in a heap and actually we didn't. We just kept going, but huge interest rates. And on a number of different occasions, we had the, the interest added on to the end of the principal so that we, when it was really very hard to find money anywhere, the boats just seemed like a big hole and you just kept pouring money in. It's always very expensive. Anything to, that's gone wrong with the boat, it's, it costs you a lot of money. Time and money. One of the things that they, which is a theme throughout the, the 90s, the 80s and 90s, was that each time they had enough money to potentially you know, pay off some debt or, or maybe do some fun stuff, they decided to put that money back into the business. So one boat turned into two, and the larger catamaran, then a smaller catamaran, the Cat 2, the Clipper, and then a big investment on the main wharf here. So a lot of sacrifice made in those early days to uh, get the business running, and um, you know, they work seven days a week, 365. Ron never took time off. We had to winkle him out of, the, out of the wheelhouse to get him to take some time off. No, there were no family holidays, and we always seemed to be working when everybody else was on holiday. He just loved his job. Dad was never gonna retire. <laughs> Yeah, he absolutely loved the harbour and being out on the boats and that was way better than retirement to him. So uh, he had his last day out here in the harbour age 69 and one of the um, bus drivers came up to me and said that his passenger had just said that was the best thing that, that, they, that they did in New Zealand. Uh, and so I was able to tell him that um, and he did, went out and did one of his last trips. And I think um, the next day, which was, which was the very last day, he got a round of applause as he was bringing the boat back into the wharf, which was quite unusual. But yeah, I mean, somewhere, someone knew that that was the last day that he was going to be out on the harbour and uh, it was really going out on a high. Hope to see some dolphins uh, today. We're going right out to the entrance to hopefully see some of them. And uh, as we travel out there, I'll put down things of interest. I always enjoyed working with my dad as well. I learned a lot from him. So I always enjoyed going out on the boat with him. He was always very professional. Uh, I'd be at home with him when he was ironing his shirts and putting his epaulets on, yeah, down on his, on his motorbike, down to the wharf, uh, rowing out with him on the boat and yeah, putting on a show, basically, with his, um, his fantastic stories. Uh, he loved his nature and always read lots and lots and lots of books and uh, was really well educated on, on the wildlife as well, so it's fantastic. Of course it's been swept by uh, mediation storms over millions of years. It's taken about six million years to sculpture this out through the woods. Just up above us too on those two ledges, it's trading near us now. The emphasis for our cruises were first of all for the history of the place, for the geology, all the volcanic eruptions and the colours of the harbour and the uh, wildlife and environment. We had no idea that the little dolphins were going to be a main source of interest in the harbour and it wasn't really until um, Liz and Steve put out all their research that people realised that 
there was something that was worth saving out on the harbour. When we first came here and, and when, when this company was just starting up, no one really cared about, about the dolphins very much. And people didn't even think that they were dolphins, they used to call them porpoises. And they didn't realise that these animals were so special. They didn't realise that they were only found in New Zealand. And they didn't realise that this harbour is one of the maybe fewer than half a dozen harbours in the world where you can find dolphins day after day after day. So they had no idea how special this was. Historically there are around 70,000 hectares dolphins around New Zealand and there's, and there's now around 10 to 15,000. And so most of the impact has been, the negative impact has been from fishing. So primarily the big gill nets, set netting, uh, and to a lesser extent trawling. We would quite frequently find dead dolphins in, in, in the harbour or on the shores that had been killed by, by set netters. And there was a lot of negative feeling about conservation initiatives limiting what set netters could do. And so this is why it was so very important to have Black Cat there at the same time promoting the positive things that the, do that the mm, dolphins mm, brought. Mm. So, so people could see that actually this is really cool. The protection that's been put in place over the last um, few years has improved things a lot. So um, now it's roughly flat lining um, and in order to have the population actually recover and make up for the losses that they suffered in those three or four decades, we'll need a bit more protection to allow them to actually recover. But they've already gone from a, a steep decline to um, almost stable. What we established with the dolphins was kind of like a partnership. So the benefits were to flow both ways. So we were to bring awareness, advocate like crazy. I mean, it's the old Jacques Cousteau quote, um, people protect what they love. So if you can take people out there and show them these beautiful dolphins and you can literally look them in the eye, then the odds of getting further protection are just greatly enhanced. It became a big part of what Ronald talked about. And in the finish, we re used to reckon that the dolphins would come and look at him because he'd walk out of, his, out of his door and he'd look over the side of the boat, at the, you know, more or less the same time, same place. So we, we always used to say the dolphins came to look at him, this person with a white beard. <laughs> Mum and Dad started this business, you know, it was a partnership, it was just them for a lot of years and they gradually brought on employees and, you know, and now we're one of the largest employers on, on Banks Peninsula. There was a real culture right from the beginning of, of delivering this outstanding experience. So it wasn't just a matter of going through the motions. You know. And so Dad was uh, really great at um, setting an example in that respect. He really cared about his, his boat, Canary Cat. Um, you could eat your, your, um, your breakfast off his engines if you wanted to. And also the, the quality of the service that, that was given. So we never, nothing was really written down back in the early days, but it was just you know, by example. I think it had a lot to do with my mum actually. <laughs> so she, um, she would make sure that dad actually wore a uniform. So that was quite interesting because my dad wanted to come on in white gumboots um, and, and stubbies, but mum actually made him wear a uniform and so that it was much more professional. It's really quite funny because he could never understand why I wanted him to go in a uniform. And for a start he would just wear um, jean shorts and a, and a shirt. No, no, you have to have a uniform. Well, in the finish, he really loved that uniform. Performed in his uniform, switch on and off he would go. <laughs> and once Dad got on board the boat as well, I think he really had a, a real desire to teach people something and show them a bit about the environment. So he was a real environmentalist long before the business was evolved around that as well. He wanted people to understand about seagulls and shags and not just the dolphins and um, he didn't want to pay too much attention to dolphins in the very beginning because he wanted people to understand about the whole environment and how, how important it all was. Uh, so there was a real desire for education I think from him from a very early age and a real push from my mother to make sure that it was done professionally. <laughs> I'd say it was quite a powerful duo really uh, with mum on shore looking after everything there and, and Dad taking care of all of the boats and the maintenance and the commentaries. In 1999 my sister and I joined the business and worked with Mum and Dad for around seven or eight years as a, as a family unit. I was the managing director and everyone had their own role and I think that's why it worked quite well as um, we all had slightly different strengths and skills and experiences and were able to operate 
our parts of the business um, and then came together you know, to deal with the various different crises and problems and challenges that we faced. We were lucky to have that time for all of us to work together. The marina storm's probably one I will never forget either. So we were sitting down at the marina, watching a massive southerly come in over the, over the tops of the hills and into the, uh, into the marina. I got a call from uh, my dad who was very worried about the situation. And he came across from Akaroa and, and moved the boat into the inner harbour. Um, it moved at around 10, 12 o'clock at night. It was really late and the wind started blowing about 2 a.m. It didn't stop for another 12 or 14 hours. So it built up this massive sea, 35 boats sunk. And the big concrete bank pontoons were breaking in half and then they were breaking into boats. And literally all of the yachts were sinking. We sat there all day and watched them all sink. And uh, our boat, thanks to Dad's foresight, was sitting in the inner harbour just floating away and we were able to keep operating our, our daily cruises two days later. It was challenging certainly in the 90s um, going out and doing the marketing. At that time I was mid-20s trying to market a new operation. I needed some extra help as well and um, it was really good when my brother came on board and decided to um, join the business as well and then spent nine years working alongside him. That was, uh, we learned an awful lot then. So we launched the Black Cat and then shortly afterwards we had an opportunity to buy Littleton Harbour Cruises. That was a business that was owned by the council and it had a contract to run the Diamond Harbour Ferry. So that's how we got into that business. We then won the, the ferry tender. But what we decided to do was um, instead of running these old 70 year old boats, we put a catamaran on there and along with ECAN we changed the timetable so instead of it being four or five times a day we agreed a, an hourly service and that really resonated with the community. Looking after a, a Littleton operation uh, there's a lot of men, a lot of skippers uh, that I was in charge of, a um, great group of guys. Didn't want to drive uh, but learned a lot about the engines and the ocean and probably gather a little bit of respect from them from knowing, sticking my head down into the uh, engine room and telling them that I thought it was a head gasket uh, that was blown and it was, so that was a bit of a highlight. <laughs> so we put this um, modern catamaran, obviously it was a lot faster uh, to get from Diamond Harbour to Littleton and one of the bits of feedback we got was uh, a little bit of a complaint that there was no longer enough time to have a good chit chat and gossip with their neighbours because the boat was going over in six minutes instead of uh, 15 minutes. It was hard to encourage uh, inbound tour operators to come to Akaroa because it was a whole day tour away and they wanted something that was a lot quicker and closer. Um, and so Littleton was a really good op um, option for that. And so starting that up was quite a challenge. Well, we had two challenges. One was the boat that we bought was quite unreliable. We bought this boat, uh, which we renamed Black Cat, but it came with these big Caterpillar engines. So every six months they would throw a valve or there'd be an engine room flood or a major problem. That cost us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it was immensely challenging to have that uh, sort of technical maintenance side letting us down. But also we had the, the, the challenge of operating you know, a new business, new staff, total new systems. So the Canterbury earthquakes in 2011 were something that no one could have predicted um, and it had a massive impact particularly here for the business in Littleton. Uh, the epicentre for the earthquake was just up on the hills here not far from where we were so the devastation around us was pretty immense. Um, as a business it meant very much changing our operations so the Littleton side of the business downscaled but through it all, through that determination and that drive to keep going, the Diamond Harbour Ferry uh, continued to operate uh, within a matter of days after the earthquake to allow the public to travel back and forth across the harbour. The Akaroa side of the business was not as impacted by the shaking itself, however obviously travel patterns changed and we saw a pretty dramatic drop in visitors coming through the region. I guess on the, the silver lining side of things was the introduction of cruise ships into Akaroa. Unable to land here in Littleton, uh, Akaroa was the nearest port and that helped our business through the, the eight years that followed those earthquakes. 2020 is a year that no one will forget with the global pandemic of COVID-19 sweeping across the world and with our government deciding to close our borders had a pretty dramatic impact once again on the business. We effectively went from 80% of our business being international tourists to zero international tourists coming through our doors. 
Once again, the team really pulled together and the close-knit Black Cat family helped each other through this uncertain time. Through COVID-19, we've had to adapt and refocus to the domestic market, and it's been really pleasing to see New Zealanders come out and experience their own backyard once again. We've shared our experiences, our part of the world, with thousands of Kiwis who we hope are now going to take our story and share it to the world. The most important part of this business are the people. I mean, the company itself can put on the catamarans and you know, nature can put on a lovely show, but it's the people that bring it to life. And we've been really lucky to have really talented, passionate people in this organisation. I've been at Black Cat Cruises for over 15 years now. And one of the key things that keeps me here and enjoying my role is the people I'm surrounded by. Black Cat was started by a small family. These days it's a much bigger family and we are a very tight knit group who help each other through the hard times and enjoy the good times. So we've operated a, a nature cruise here in Akaroa um, since 1985, about 36 years, and I think Dad operated around 21 years of those. Uh, and we had another character called uh, Julian Yates, Capitano Giuliano, um, as he was known, and, and he was such a passionate, humble, funny uh, Kiwi, and he was a, um, an incredible part of the team uh, here. So you'd go past um, Black Cat with Julian on board and he would start nattering away about um, oh those are the researchers and you could hear him talking to the passengers about us. Most of what he said uh, was true. Most of what he said was true. <laughs> yes, he'd always crack lots of jokes on the boat and tell people stuff that was, you know, maybe a little bit more crazy. But, you know, having a character like that yeah. on the harbour yeah. um, is, is really cool. I actually read the 1999 business plan, so it was actually quite interesting to look back 21 years to see what we thought the company might become. And I think we've exceeded our expectations. We certainly had big goals and, and vision, but winning you know, Supreme Tourism Award and a number of tourism awards along the way, carrying you know, hundreds of thousands of people safely and delivering these great experiences. To be honest, there's a whole lot of things I'm really proud about when I think back on the last 21 years and then also try and look forward another 21 years and the business that I've been involved with here. Got a business here that's led Banks Peninsula in, in tourism and it's done it properly. We've certainly benchmarked ourselves with other major operators around the South Island, continued to invest in our people and in our business. So I'm, I'm super proud of that. I suppose I'm most proud of some of the people that have come through the company. Some of them started as deckhands and are now in charge. Others start as you know, crew members or people washing wetsuits and end up as skippers. And so you know, that's always, a, always great as well. When I first started there was two boats and four staff and when I finished there was nine boats and 40 staff. So what we created here together as a family was fantastic for the tourism industry, not just for Akaroa in Canterbury, but for New Zealand. So looking back over the last 35 years, we would never have thought, I would never have thought, that the company would be in the position that it is now, having bought multiple boats, employed multiple people, won tourism awards, we never have thought that we'd be in this position now. And look at it now, amazing. I think we just knew that if we hung in there, it would come right, and it did. And besides, they said, it can't be done. And we've often thought, shouldn't say that to a Bingham. <laughs> We're gonna prove you wrong, and we did, yeah. It was fun though. <laughs>